All right, well, it's great to see so many people here for the Dark Energy School. I'm sorry I wasn't able to be at the earlier sessions. I've been in meetings all day, and we'll be going back to meetings after this. Um, so I should introduce myself. I'm Jeff Newman from the University of Pittsburgh. I'm the deputy spokesperson of the collaboration. So if you have any questions about the how the collaboration works, how to get going in the collaboration, things like that, please come talk to me. Um, and there, I won't, there are some preparations we want to make. So first of all, who here does not have Python installed on a laptop with the setup we requested? Raise your hands. OK, I don't think there's any cases, maybe one case where there are two people with their hands raised by each other. If you can find someone who does have a laptop set up, go sit with them. So I'm going to ask people to move if, if, you, if your neighbors uh, are not there. Um, and then I've got a request for everyone who does have a laptop, which is if you go to the Dark Energy School page. Um, oh, I'm still muted. Thank you. Oh, it's this microphone that's picking me up. That's what it me. All right. If you go to the Dark Energy School page, um, you'll find uh, two files. Oops. Uh, data trim .fits .gz and photos lessons that ipynb I'd like you all to download those files to a working directory um, and we'll be using those to actually do photos ease and play with some of the factors that affect photos ease all together um, and again if you don't have a laptop with Python set up uh, follow along with your neighbors I'm going to want everyone to work with your neighbors uh, groups of two or three, uh, there will be items for you to discuss and as we go through uh, this notebook, um, I want you to, to discuss what you're going to do, what you expect to find, try to predict what you're going to see before executing any bit of code and I'll talk you through that again as we go on. Okay, so what am I going to be talking about? Number one, uh, just an overview of photometric redshifts, aiming at people who have no experience with them at all. Uh, the basic ways we try to measure photometric redshifts, why we care about them. And then, if we have time, I'll try to talk about some of the open issues in photosees. So areas where new thoughts, new ideas, new work is very welcome and very helpful uh, to help you get ideas of, uh, you know, what are things you might want to work on for desk. So, uh, starting out, you know, we're doing LSST uh, in large part to study dark energy. And the way we study dark energy um, is uh, by measuring things that are functions of redshift and comparing to models. And so, you know, we have the major probes, uh, you know, weak lensing, BAO, supernovae, cluster counts, strong lensing isn't on this plot. But all of these are measuring uh, uh, functions of redshift. Weak lensing, it's the shear is a function of redshift. BAO, it's the scale, the angular scale, the baryon acoustic scale is a function of redshift. For clusters, it's the abundance of clusters as a function of redshift. For supernovae, it's the luminosity distance to supernova as a function of redshift. So we don't get any of these constraints unless we have redshifts. So, what you could say is, okay, we'll go out and measure them. So, I'll use the term photo Z's a lot. The reason I do that is Z is the standard symbol for redshift, if you, if you haven't seen that before. And so, redshift is, is allowing us to measure uh, basically by what factor the universe has expanded since light left the object you're looking at. So, the scale of the universe grows proportional to 1 over 1 plus Z. So, Z of 0 is today, 1 over 1 plus Z zero, so the scale factor is one today. Z of infinity is the Big Bang. And redshift for an observation allows us to put an, that observation on that timeline from the Big Bang in today. Um, and so we're studying uh, dark energy, we're studying dark gravity, galaxy evolution, wide variety of things by measuring functions of redshift. And the classic way you measure a redshift, and this goes back to, you know, uh, 100 years or more, was to measure the spectrum of light from an object. 
Um, and uh, you compare the observed wavelengths of spectral features, so the Balmer series of hydrogen, for instance, a set of n to 2 transitions in hydrogen have particular wavelengths. If you see multiple of those transitions, you know you're able to identify by their wavelength ratio what those transitions are. And by comparing the observed wavelengths of those transitions to the laboratory wavelengths of those transitions, you now have a determination of how the wavelengths of light have been stretched since it left an object. You have a determination of the redshift. Um, and so the uh, z is just the observed wavelength over the rest frame wavelength minus 1. Zero today, uh, infinite stretching for the Big Bang gives you z of infinity, et cetera. So you do this with a, a spectrograph, an instrument that breaks down light into, its, into fluxes at every wavelength, or every wavelength covered by the spectrograph. You find those multiple features, you've got the redshift, and you're done. So the problem is, if you want to do this for LSST, at the depth of the weak lensing gold sample, so I of 25.3, it takes about 100 hours on the largest telescopes on Earth today, on 10 meter telescopes, to get a redshift 75% of the time. We'll talk a little bit about why it's 75 and not 100% of the time with the spectrograph. So you can do this one object at a time, 100 hours here, 100 hours here, 100 hours here. We can do better, and there are designs for spectrograph. Uh, being built now that have 5,000 fibers. So they can look at almost 5,000 objects at a time. Some of those fibers go to the sky. So you put a 5,000 fiber spectrograph on a 10 meter telescope. And you know, the gold samples, you know, billions of objects, uh, 4 billion galaxies. So it's more than 50,000 years on the biggest telescope on Earth to do this. David. Well, 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 well the, these, are, these are secure redshifts, which you, we need. So, so we'll talk about the trade-offs. We'll talk about why you do photo Z's in a moment. Um, but this is, this is, this is Desi-like signal to noise. This is not high signal to noise. Um, so, uh, so in fact, Desi will be a higher success rate than this. Um, so 50,000 years, the, that's, you know, that's going to take us a lot of grad student lifetimes. So we need to do something different if we don't want to wait 50,000 years for LSST results. No, you need 50,000 telescopes to do it in one year. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's expensive. You know, the, a 10 meter telescope is, you know, $150 million or something like that. So that's, that's expensive. So what we do instead are photo Z's, photometric redshifts. So what we do is we use the broad features in a spectrum to determine redshift. So if you, you detected this transition, this transition, this transition, you know, you know you're able to identify from the wavelength ratio what those transitions are. And so if you had the, this detailed spectrum, you get the redshift right off, and it would be very secure because this is unique ratio. If you only have imaging, you've measured the integrated flux through a filter, so that's light over some wavelength range. So you measure the average flux in different bins of wavelength. Um, and then you can basically try to fit a model to those observations, try to determine what redshift uh, gives the best fit uh, for a template spectrum compared to these observations. That's one method. We'll talk about different ways of doing photosynthesis. And so the advantage is we get a very high multiplexing. We can do this for all of the LSST objects at once. So it's not 5,000 at a time. It's 4 billion once you've got the LSST catalog. But the disadvantage is Number one, the redshifts you get are lower in precision, right? If you measure the wavelength of this and the wavelength of this, you can measure those to, you know, part and, and 100,000 easily. Uh, so you get a very precise redshift from something like that. Instead, if you're relying on these broad features, well, you could shift that spectrum significantly. You could shift it by 1 or 2% and still be consistent with, uh, with the observations with those redshifts. Um, so we get a lower precision from photoses. And we also have basically calibration uncertainties. Because uh, it turns out the, the set of possible galaxy spectra is complicated. That influences what you infer about the redshift compared to what the truth would be. And so we really need to understand that mapping from color to redshift, any biases in that, any uncertainties in that, extremely well, or will, will exceed the requirements for LSST. So for LSST, we have a requirement that for any sample you look at, you need to know the mean redshift to about 0.002 times 1 plus z, and you need to know the uncertainty in the photo z's to about 0.002 times 1 plus z. So that's 0.2%. If we exceed those limits, then 
photo Z calibration uncertainties will dominate over random errors in LSST cosmology. These are extremely stringent requirements uh, given that we can't actually get spectra like this to just calibrate a fair, fair sample uh, with completeness. Again, 75 percent of the time we get a redshift, 25 percent of the time that calibration information is unknown. We'll look at the impact of that. You said we need to know the z of 0.2 percent. We need to know the mean z for a sample, not for an individual object. For an individual object, 5 percent uncertainties are okay. Uh, the limits of the LSST system would be something like 2 percent for this goldless world sample. Um, if you had perfect knowledge of, of these templates, for instance. Um, but 5 percent is fine. It's really the calibration would cause you to exceed the requirements. And the reason for that is, is for instance, for weak lensing, the weak lensing effect, the shear, is a very slow function of redshift. So if you smear that with a Gaussian 0.05 1 plus z kernel, it doesn't really change that function much. So it doesn't change your, your precision of constraints. It changes it slowly. I'll, I'll, um, I don't have an illustration of that. Ah, I took out some slides that would have been helpful. Yeah. Anyway, so the reason we can do this is because spectra actually have strong features in them often. So this is now an illustration. This is a, a, a spectrum, a template spectrum for redshift seven galaxies. So the highest redshifts that we're exploring today. Um, and there's a number of features here. So first of all, you can see these absorption lines. So these are just the Balmer series of hydrogen by and large. Uh, we have other species contributing out here. Um, we see what we call a break in the spectrum. There's a jump in the spectrum around 4,000 angstroms for, uh, for old stellar populations, around uh, slightly shorter wavelengths going from 4,000 to 3,500 for younger stellar populations. Um, so if you see a jump in the spectrum, that's a hint, okay, that you may be looking around 4,000 angstroms. So if you're looking at fluxes in two different bands, photometric bands, if the flux is much higher in the redder band than the bluer band, you'd say, okay, that might be where 4,000 angstrom's rest frame is occurring, and then the observed frame is between those bands. Um, but that's not uh, trivial because there's other jumps in the spectrum, in particular the Lyman break, so uh, hydrogen's very efficient at, at absorbing uh, photons below Lyman alpha at, uh, at low, uh, or at a given redshift, the hydrogen at lower redshifts is efficient at absorbing Lyman alpha, uh, or absorbing light. Um, and so we have another break in the spectrum. So one problem is you may confuse one break for another break. You may think you have a Lyman break, and in fact you have a 4,000 angstrom break. This is a very big problem in looking at z of seven galaxies, because you can get a very similar spectrum, observed spectrum, from a redshift seven galaxy with this Lyman break, or a redshift two galaxy, to two and a half that just has extra, that has a lot of dust which tends to absorb light at blue wavelengths so you just lose this part of the spectrum and you only get the part of the spectrum above the break and you say, ah, I found something, I found a Lyman break here but really it was a Balmer break at a lower redshift. So we have problems in photo Z's of sometimes we get the wrong answer from a given algorithm or sometimes there are multiple solutions that can both explain uh, the, the visible properties. Um, and so these are just illustrations of the coverage of different filters. Um, most of the LSST filters are actually down here. We have U, G, R, I, and Z uh, spanning from, uh, from the ultraviolet for the U band, barely ultraviolet, to the almost one micron for the Z band. Then we have a Y band filter just beyond one micron. Uh, and then these are filters that are really only efficiently possible from space. So any questions about this picture of why we have information for photometric redshifts? Okay. So that picture was nice. We have this nice strong break. You, you determine, to, you find two bands, you've got the redshift. The real world galaxies vary. And so these are now uh, predicted spectra from a, a, a template library basically, a library that puts together spectra of individual stars and assumptions about the star formation history, so you know how many you know, A giant stars and how many G dwarf stars and so on there would be a given time after a burst of star formation. So you can produce predicted spectra. Um, and these spectra you'll see a, a, a variety. Number one, in the youngest objects, you have strong emission lines from regions of ionized gas so around the hottest, most massive stars, which are very short-lived. If you look at the oldest populations, 
you see a lack of those emission lines, and you see many more absorption features in the optical coming from cooler stars. Um, and uh, whereas you see those strong breaks in the oldest populations, the youngest are very nearly a power line. So those spectral features are weak. It's hard to get photoses for the bluest galaxies as a result because you can involve this power law with different, uh, it, place it at different redshifts, involve it with your filters, you actually get the same colors. So that's a challenge. Um, whereas for red galaxies, you can get very good photoses. Um, with, with current data, you can get 1% photoses for red galaxies up to redshift 1. Uh, whereas for bluer galaxies, it's 2%, 3% uh, in good cases. Um, for LSST, this is a challenge because the further back in time we go, uh, at least up to redshift 1 or so, the star formation rate is going up and up. The average age of the stars in those galaxies is lower. So we're more and more dominated by blue star forming objects. And the things that look red in general at higher redshift will be extincted by dust which gives more a continuous roll off rather than having these strong features. And if you confuse a dusty galaxy for a intrinsically red, low dust, low star formation rate galaxy, you'll get the wrong redshift at a level that's beyond our calibration requirements. So if you look at the performance uh, for photos for disease for LSST, this is an optimistic scenario where we know the actual set of templates perfectly. We know the range of galaxy spectra perfectly. Um, this is work done by Sam Schmidt, who's a co-convener of the PhotoZ working group. Gesundheit. So we'll be looking at a lot of plots like this. So I should sort of walk you through this plot. Gesundheit. Um, we're plotting photometric redshift as a function of spectroscopic redshift for a set of objects. And in this plot, number one, you can see most things are along the axis. That's good. But you can also see these sort of degenerate solutions where you're confusing, in this case, objects that are actually at redshift of two or three, but are very blue and have very similar colors to galaxies at redshift of more like 0.2. Okay, so this is a degenerate solution here. We can also see uh, regions where the band coverage is not overlapping so much. Uh, there are, again, smaller degeneracies that occur. The points in red are the ones with the best determined redshifts, ones that appear not to have strong degeneracies. And you can see that the, those have a tighter relationship between photo Z and spec Z than the general population. So you can identify some of the outliers, well, many of the outliers. But if you look at this on, on your computer as opposed to on the screen, um, you'll see that, uh, in fact, um, uh, there are still red points here. There are still cases where you're going to get the wrong redshift from a photo Z algorithm. This is a simulation. That's why we know the templates perfectly. So this is a simulation where the spectra are based on real data. But nonetheless, uh, it's, a, it's a finite set of templates. So if you look at the photo Z performance, our requirement on the photo Z performance for LSST is that 5% level. And again, that's driven by weak lensing. But uh, that's a, a requirement on the performance without having perfect template knowledge. It turns out if you have perfect template knowledge, if you have basically a 2% uh, photo Z uh, without perfect template knowledge, at worst that becomes 5%. So if you ask what is the requirement on this plot, the requirement is if this plot is below 2%, we should meet that requirement of 5% with the real world data. If we have our current level of, of galaxy template knowledge, if we get better knowledge, and I'll talk about how to do that, then we can bring that down. So this is if we have perfect knowledge of galaxy spectra, we're down here. Of, intrinsic, of the intrinsic range of galaxy spectra. If we have imperfect knowledge like today, we're maybe up here. Uh, and so with perfect knowledge, we're exceeding the requirements with our LSST photo Z errors for this weak lensing gold sample. Okay. How are these outliers treated and calculated with sigma? Yeah, so this is an outlier resistant sigma. So uh, what's often used is a, a calculation based on the median absolute deviation. So the median of the absolute values of the differences between uh, the spec Z and the photo Z. Um, that's a very common uh, measure used. And then you just turn it into a, a, a Gaussian size um, based on, based on the, the factor by which you, you, you tra that, that transforms the median absolute deviation to a sigma. So that's what was done here. Um, but we do have to worry about these outliers. So that's the plot here. Whoa. That's the plot down here as uh, the outlier fraction. And our requirement is 10%. 
So we need to understand that outlier fraction well. So if we don't, we're, we're sunk in the water. But if our outlier fraction is below 10%, most of the information is in the core. We get out that weak lensing information from all the, you know, the 90% correlate, correlate with the 90% properly. The outliers are sort of all over the place. Uh, so if you understand that outlier fraction, then you're okay. okay? So that's a, a problem of calibration, understanding the results of your photo Z problem. Okay. So your red points versus black points are there? So those are, the red points have most of the probability in a single peak in the, in the probability distribution, which I'll define in a moment. Um, so that's the distinction. So that's used, so that's something you can do based on the, the output of a photo Z algorithm. So it's not know, having knowledge going in. Um, but in this scenario where you know the spectra perfectly, the real world is not that clean. But in that scenario, you can actually pick out those objects pretty well. And one thing we'll be exploring is in the real world, how do we do? Okay. So there are two major methods of determining photo Z, very broadly defined. So I'll talk about them separately. The first is what I'll call template-based photoses. The second is training-based photoses. So in the case of template-based photoses, it's very much like that example I showed you. Uh, you, uh, you basically have a set of template spectra, and you shift the redshift of those spectra to see how well they match the observed colors of an object. Um, so in this case, you need a, a training set of galaxies still. You need some galaxies that you know the redshifts for, from spectroscopy, so you know them well, and have the measured colors for, so you can constrain the range of underlying spectral energy distributions of flux as a function of redshift, um, and, uh, and, and tweak uh, your photometric band passes or calibrations to, to, to get the best uh, fit to the data. Um, so in this case, what we're doing is determining a posterior probability distribution. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, for the redshift, given the photometry, given the measurements of fluxes in different bands. Um, but at the same time, if you're fitting a, a template, I showed you those galaxy templates look different for galaxies of different ages, different star formation histories. So you get information about other parameters at the same time as redshift. Right? You can say, okay, what is the best star formation history for this galaxy? Or even look at it in a two-dimensional way. What is the probability of a particular star formation history and redshift for each galaxy? Um, so that, that can be very useful. A lot of, uh, a lot of uh, LSST science will rely on that. Um, it is the case, though, that you really want spectra of galaxies that span the full range of properties of things you're going to, to be applying the photo Z's to. Those allow you to tune your templates, make them better. Those allow you to establish priors for redshift as a function of magnitude, for instance. Um, this is just an illustration of that. This is a, a set of, of photo Z spec Z plots. Uh, from Albert et al. 2006, a data set that was trained, so this is now 1 plus z spec, 1 plus z folk, for different magnitude ranges. This data set was trained with a sample that only goes to redshift 1 and a sample that's weighted towards red galaxies. So when you apply those photo z's to uh, deep 2 galaxies, which now go to redshift 1.4 and are more weighted towards blue galaxies, you find a much higher scatter you know, a lot more points near these sort of outlier limits and beyond than you do in, in the regime that's constrained by the training set. So that's something to be wary of. Even these training-based methods um, have limitations to how they extrapolate. And we need to worry about that. So what sort of measurements will we get from an algorithm? There are codes that will simply return a, a best fit redshift and some errors. Uh, uncertainties, especially when we talk about the machine learning training set based techniques, that's most commonly what you're going to be getting out. Um, for most cosmological analyses, it's better to use the posterior probability distribution, so the probability of a given redshift given the flux measurements. Um, and if you're not familiar with probability distribution functions, um, first of all, you should. Uh, try to learn more about statistics. As astronomers in particular, we tend not to be trained very much about statistics, but uh, you'll, you'll be able to do uh, much more uh, with data if you understand uh, statistics than uh, if you don't. Um, but the way a probability distribution is defined, first of all, it has to be non-negative, has to integrate to 1. So the integral from 0 to infinity of p of z is 1. And the probability that the redshift is between a and b is just the integral from A to B of this function P of Z. And so this is a pr 
probability distributions for the redshifts for one particular object in the candle survey. Uh, so we have five different codes. Each of them gives us a P of Z. So a probability that the object is at a particular redshift. All of these are template-based methods. You'll notice that all of these curves differ from each other. Um, the actual answer is 1.33, so that's about here. And all of the curves are consistent with that. But this is the same underlying photometry, but different algorithms to determine the P of Z, different set of templates to try to get redshift information out of that photometry. So you can see there's a wide range of uncertainty with the current uh, set, of, set, of, set of methods, template-based methods. Uh, we want to have better templates than this for, for LSST, better understanding what's going on. Is that true over an ensemble? I mean, of course. Yes. I'll, I'll uh, actually, I may not get to that slide, so let's see if I can uh, show you a demonstration of this. Here we go. Uh, so this is actually for ensembles adding up the P of Zs in bins of H band magnitude. Oops. Um, and you can see the structure of this. This is density of basically probability of redshift in each column normalized to one. So you can see the structure of this looks very different from code to code. So yes, it's unfortunately uh, different for ensembles too. Okay. So for codes that provide a, a, an estimate of the redshift, if you go and look at, at data from someone providing photo disease, they'll often provide a redshift, right? Um, so they'll provide some number that's supposed to be the redshift of the object, some uncertainty on that. Um, and uh, there, there are a variety of definitions for that. So one definition would be just the peak of this probability distribution. One definition would be the expectation value of the redshift. So basically, you know, interval of z times p of z over interval of p of z, which is one. Um, those will give you somewhat different values. And when you're Photo Z, P of Z is multimodal. When there are degenerate solutions, you could have two peaks. Of course, it makes a big difference. Do you calculate this expectation value only on the highest peak and completely ignore the other one? Or do you calculate the expectation value um, combining both peaks, which will generally give you an unphysical answer, right? Because uh, if, you, if you imagine you have a peak here and a peak here and they're even height, the expectation value is halfway in between where there's no probability. So, which uh, is kind of unfortunate. Ideally, but a lot of the, if they're providing just a sigma for something that's two peaks, of course, that's, it's not Gaussian. So that's uh, very deceptive. And so you'd, you'd end up with an error estimate here that's, uh, that's, that's putting all the probability, again, in between those two peaks. Uh, I guess there is a white, whiteboard. I can sketch it. So you'd have something like this. So uh, the P of Z is doing this, and your expectation value will give you a distribution that looks like something like that, right? So basically none of the probability uh, for th that's recorded in the catalog for that object is actually at a redshift that object could be at, which is of course unfortunate. Okay. So we can get more complicated though. Uh, we can get information about galaxy properties from the template fit as I, I talked about. Um, in some of the simpler codes, there's a, a finite set of templates. So some number of templates, it can be three, it can be 10, uh, it can be 100. So you might have an index of your best, uh, 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 of the template. You know, you're just ranking the order, rank ordering them in terms of age or what have you. Or you can have lots of physical parameters. So the stellar mass of the galaxy, the star formation rate of the galaxy, the amount of dust extinction, which affects all the colors. Um, so this is coming from a code called Beagle that tries to properly marginalize all the, all the parameters defining a galaxy spectrum and fit for redshift at the same time. So now we have like a, a six dimensional space here. So six different parameters we're constraining simultaneously. We have a probability for any combination of those parameters. Uh, and you can marginalize over everything else to get say the probability distribution of redshift. Um, or you can look at other properties, age, metallicity here. So this is a probability, whoops probability distribution for metallicity. Um, here's a probability distribution for stellar mass. You can see some of these parameters are constrained very well by the data, and some of these parameters are constrained very poorly by the data. All right? That's useful to know. Um, however, if you've got a six-dimensional distribution for every object in LSST, that's a really large amount of data to store per object. 
So it's challenging to have that much, ob object, that much information available at your fingertips. We need to be smart about how to do that, probably by using samples from the distribution. Okay. Any questions so far? All right. So I've got a question for all of you to discuss uh, in groups of two or three before we move on, uh, which is what quantities do you want for each LSST data galaxy? What, what, what information do you care about? Not, what form of, or do you want the redshift in? A single redshift, the distribution? What other things, stellar mass, star formation rate, dust, whatever? And then we'll hear some reports back. So take a couple of minutes to discuss with your neighbors, and we'll move on. All right. It's great to see all this discussion. Uh, and I'm, you know, we'll get some answers now, but it would be great uh, if you all talk about this more at lunch, feedback to the PhotoZ working group, myself, Sam Schmidt, Ophir Lahav, because uh, we'd like to know what people want. But I'd like some answers from around the room. So anyone over here like to speak up? Uh, can I, okay. Okay. Okay, great. Full multidimensional likelihood of redshift, ellipticity, position. Someone from the center section? Go and speak up. No wrong answers. Uh, Tony? The same thing, but add morphology at, at the uh, first guess, type of galaxy, and then Okay, use morphology to improve the templates. Past redshift one, that's not going to be very informative, unfortunately, because the morphologies are not so simple as at lower redshifts. But at lower redshifts, that can help. Over here? Everyone's asleep over here? I heard people talking. Yeah? Anything that correlates with the halo mass. Anything that correlates with the halo mass. Very good. So stellar mass, color, both definitely have correlations. Uh, Yeah, of course, this analysis is very expensive per object, but it also ignores correlations between these parameters. You may be able to do better than this, uh, more efficiently than this uh, in, in the real world. Okay, so how does a template fitting algorithm work? Typically, the algorithm will determine the likelihoods of the colors, so the ratios of the fluxes between bands, I'll define color for, uh, in the astronomical sense in a, in a minute, as a function of redshift and templates. So the likelihood uh, we often in a code gets calculated as just chi-squared, so the differences between the observed values and the model values squared over sigma squared summed up, uh, or in some cases the codes will do a calculation of chi-squared versus redshift for each template and just score keep the minimum chi-squared out of all those templates at a given redshift, um, which is not the proper marginalization. So here, for instance, we have three different templates. This is a plot from Chicho Benitez's BPZ paper. So for each template, you get a likelihood of, uh, uh, for each redshift, the probability that you got the observed data as a function of redshift under the assumption of each of these three templates. So the next thing that the codes will generally utilize is some sort of prior and um, what is the probability, if you knew nothing about its colors, but just one magnitude, what is the probability that object is at a given redshift? So we're using colors to calculate the likelihood. We're using a magnitude, so a, a flux measurement, a single flux bit measurement to calculate a prior for each redshift. So based on the magnitude of this object, uh, it's likely to be an, have an irregular type spectrum uh, compared to other types of spectrum, more likely to be at uh, redshift one and a half, and then we just multiply the likelihood by the prior, uh, sum up over the different possible templates, and we get the posterior, so the probability of redshift given the flux and magnitude measurements. Okay? And so in the end, we end up with this posterior that's basically the product of this and this, summed up over the three possible templates. You can see we have some probability out here at Z of three, most of the probability is at Z less than 0.6. Okay? Um, so this is just very standard Bayesian language that hopefully you've seen before, but uh, just to, to write it down sort of symbolically, 
So the probability of the fluxes given the redshift is the likelihood. So that's, you know, assuming a redshift, how likely it is you got the observed fluxes. The prior uh, is P of Z, actually I should have written given magnitude. So that's the prior. Um, and P of redshift given the fluxes, that's what we want out if we're looking at a single object generally. It's not necessarily what we want for looking at ensembles. Um, so that's the posterior. Um, so that's what we know about the redshift given the magnitude measurements we have. And we're just applying Bayes' theorem, the probability of redshift given fluxes is the probability of the fluxes given redshift, the prior, the, sorry, the likelihood, multiplied by the probability of a given redshift, knowing nothing about the colors. That's the prior. Um, and in Bayes' theorem, there's actually this normalization, the probability of fluxes that's basically the sum over all possible models of what's the, likelihood, what's the probability you got the fluxes. But we're looking at probability distributions. Probability distributions have to integrate to one. So most of the codes will cheat and say, well, we know it has to integrate to one, so you just sum up this over all redshifts and you have that, that normalization. Is there a way to make sure Yeah, so I'm a big fan of hierarchical methods, basically methods that have free parameters to describe the priors that you fit at the same time as the data um, to the ensemble of galaxy colors. Um, and I think in, in the long term, that's, that's where things will be going. Uh, right now, uh, these priors are basically based on training sets. So, uh, you know, all these curves are based on a tiny field of the Hubble Deep Field North. Um, tiny, tiny patch of sky where there are estimates of photo Zs that were used to sort of train a prior that's then used as input for, for photo Zs across the sky. That's, of course... Pick one analysis of large-scale structure lensing. We're going to be using these as inputs, right? We're not going to be doing the photo Z fits at the same time. So, if there's some... Yeah, well, that, we, we may be redoing photo Z fits at the same time. So, in, in the hierarchical case, yeah, it's, so there, there, there are certainly efforts to define uh, methods that can do that, that can actually use the fact, for instance, that uh, um, the evolution of the power spectrum is at some level predictable. Um, so you can use that fact to sort of inform whether you're getting the redshift distributions right um, and fold that in simultaneously. So uh, amongst other people, Gary Bernstein is doing some work in that area. Okay. So template-based photo Zs uh, are one major strain. Uh, what we'll actually do today, uh, although we're running low on time, aren't we, um, is, is we'll play with a, a training-based algorithm. So the idea is basically you have some set of training galaxies, some set of galaxies that have known redshifts, which you'd measure spectroscopically, so secure redshifts and uh, either a uniform sampling or a very well un understood sampling, and use those to constrain the mapping between galaxy colors and redshift. Um, and the advantage of this is there's a lot of work in machine learning and statistics that's developed very efficient methods of predictions uh, for vast numbers of different cases. Uh, so these can perform very fast. They can make sort of optimal use of the information available. Um, but they generally extrapolate very, very, very poorly. And in the real world, um, we tend to have trouble um, getting complete spectroscopy, so we get redshifts for a systematic subset of the galaxies out there at a given color, at a given magnitude. So in that case, these <coughs> algorithms will mispredict the redshift because their training set is, is incomplete. Um, so you really need a training set that, that really spans the full range of properties, full range of redshifts, on and on in the galaxies if you're going to get accurate results from machine learning methods. If you don't, you have to calibrate them out. So there's a wide variety of methods that have been used, um, mostly jargon here. Um, and it's the case that for very bright, very close galaxies, if you look at the Sloan Digital Sky Survey data set and go down to R17.77, the limit of their spectroscopy, the training set based methods and the template set based methods um, have basically identical performance. So that tells us that in that limit, the template based methods um, are using all the information that's there, uh, at least you know, everything that's been looked at as an input to the machine learning algorithms, which includes sizes and things like that. Um, and uh, so you get basically 2% photo Z errors with Sloan uh, with any good method. 
You can come up with bad methods, of course. Um, you know, I can have a photo Z algorithm that the redshift is 0.1 for any object, and of course that's going to be bad for a lot of objects. It'll be very good for a su certain subset. Um, but, but any good method is going to have very similar performance. As we go to fainter objects at higher redshifts, the problem is worse. And so what we're going to spend most of our time, the rest of our time doing, is photometric redshifts. Um, so we're going to work in particular with a data set put together by Rong Ku Zhou, who's a student at the University of Pittsburgh, um, which is intended to be an empirical data set that resembles LSST data. Uh, so it's taken uh, CFHT legacy survey imaging and UGRI and Z, and we obtained deep imaging with Subaru in the Y band. So that's our imaging, UGRI, Z, Y, just like LSST. And then for redshifts, we combine uh, the Deep 2 Galaxy Survey, Deep 3, which was the successor, successor to Deep 2, and 3D HST, which is a very different project that uses a, a GRISM on the Hubble Space Telescope to get sort of lower quality redshifts, but that can push you into higher redshift domain. That's the red points here. Um, and so if you just take out of the box a uh, training set based algorithm, easy. Uh, you get a photo Z spec Z plot like this with a machine learning algorithm that we'll be applying. You get a photo Z spec Z plot like this. You can see, first of all, the outliers look very different in these two plots. One reason is the template based methods know that there could be galaxies here. There are no training galaxies at redshifts two and a half to three other than a handful. So it's extremely unlikely that the training set based method would ever even put something there. There are things that templates get in, in code are physical knowledge about galaxies that if they're not in your training set, the machine learning algorithms discard. But it's also the case, if you look here, right, there's this degeneracy that the template-based methods have trouble with that the training set-based methods do fine with. So it's also the case that right now with the existing template sets, um, there's information that's in the data in the structure of the data that the machine learning techniques are able to pull out, that the, the template-based techniques aren't handling uh, optimally. And that means there's room to improve. Um, so we're going to apply photo Z's with a particular algorithm, actually the same one used here, uh, which is based on random forest. So we're going to take advantage of the fact that there's a lot of efforts to implement machine learning algorithm, algorithm in Python, so in particular in the scikit-learn path package. So random forest is one of the, you know, one of the most effective machine learning methods and when you're just doing a, a blind, you know, first thing to try. Uh, it often wins uh, competitions on Kaggle and things like that. Um, it's based on the idea of decision trees. So where you have a set of, of data quantities, in our case it'll be a set of colors of objects, um, and tries to infer, predict for each sort of branch of the tree you follow of, of, you know, is it redder than R minus I of 0.6, is it bluer than U minus Q of 0.2, tries to predict redshift out of that. But what's random about random forest is two things. Number one is it trains a, a set of trees, um, not just one decision tree, um, and each set of trees uh, has a bootstrapped training sample. So you take your training sample and randomly choose a sample of the same size, allowing objects to, to repeat in that sample. And so you have trees that are trained differently. And the other thing that's, that's, that varies is each tree uses only a subset of the input measurements of the galaxy colors. Um, so each tree has a random subset of things, a random training set, so it seems like you're just putting noise in, noise in, but in fact gives very nice results. Um, and so, uh, so we combine the results from all these trees that each you might think are suboptimal in a different way. They aren't using a fair sample of the data, they aren't using all the information, but you do a combination of those and you get something that's a pretty nice predictor for redshift. Okay, so it's time to open your laptops, uh, load the Jupyter Notebook that you downloaded, so the way you do this uh, typically on a Mac is open up a terminal, go to the directory where you put that file, and you type Jupyter, which is spelled with a Y, not an I, uh, space notebook, and space the name of the notebook, which you can just you know, do tab completion, or you can just do Jupyter notebook, it'll bring up a list of files, and you just click on the notebook. 
Um, and so the notebook contains uh, text, things I've written in Python code in a structured way. Um, and the way you use this is to execute a block of code. And I'll sort of walk you through the first parts, and then we'll start working on our own. Um, you click in the box, and you hold down Shift and type Enter. And that'll execute the code in that box. And if you don't have a laptop, please you know, find someone who does, who's working on this, work together, uh, talk to each other about the results. Um, so the first thing we do is we just import a set of Python routines. Um, the important ones are astropy.table, which is a routine that reads in structured data files, including text files, or in our case, an astronomical format called FITS. Uh, so we need that table routine. We need the random forest regressor routine, which is what's going to do all the work today. And then, I probably won't uh, spend time talking about, but we also have a few routines to do what's called cross-validation, which is a better way of, of testing machine learning results. OK. So first thing we do is we read in the table of data. Thank you. First thing we do is we read in the table of data. So you click in the first box, hit shift enter, that does the import. Click in the second box, hit shift enter, that'll read in the table of data. Uh, and then we do a couple things. We just see how big is the catalog. You should find there's 8,500 objects in the catalog. If you didn't, something's wrong. Uh, and then we can determine what is the information in this structured catalog. Um, and I'll walk you through these. So first of all, U, G, R, I, Z, and Y are magnitude measurements. So a magnitude is an astronomer's way of, of recording log flux, basically. So it's uh, minus 2.5, got a typo there, minus 2.5 times the log 10 of the flux relative to some reference flux, which we call the zero point. We have errors in all those quantities. Whoops, whoa. Errors in all those quantities, which we'll use. So this is just a list of columns in that, in, in that catalog. We have a radius measurement, so we can explore does galaxy size make a difference. Uh, we have the redshift, which uh, is labeled as Z helio, because it's the heliocentric redshift. It's the redshift measured from the rest frame of the sun. The reason we do that is the Earth's motion around the sun is fast enough it actually uh, can alter some, some results. So we, we, we remove that annual motion in reference to the sun. You could instead reference to the galactic center or to the mass, uh, center mass of the local group. And then finally, this thing UB0, which is an estimate of the rest frame U minus B colors, that's ultraviolet and blue filters of an object. So that's minus 2.5 times the log 10 of the flux ratio between the U band flux and the B band flux. But the sense of this is that bigger values are redder. And that's the important thing to know. It's a measurement of log of flux ratio such that the bigger values are right. OK. So there's a function here that do, does a lot of work, but not much of it is interesting. This just makes a plot, that photo Z spec Z plot. So that's all this stuff here. And then calculates a set of statistics to judge how good our photo Zs are. And that set of statistics is, first of all, just the standard deviation of Z fot minus Z spec. We always normalize to 1 plus Z spec, which takes out uh, what you, t you tend to see photo Z errors scaling with 1 plus Z. So this takes that out. The normalized median absolute deviation, the statistic we talked about earlier for a robust method of estimating the scatter, throwing out outliers. So that's a, a scatter without outliers. We have a percentage of outliers too, though, so we know how much we threw out. And then we also look at whether our photo Zs are biased by looking at the median offset between Z-spec and Z-foot. Um, so we do those calculations, make a plot. I won't work, walk you through how to do plotting in, in Python. Then we just take this catalog that you can see is kind of inconvenient to write with brackets and quotes all the time. So we just create a set of variables corresponding to the columns of the catalog. Each is a one-dimensional array for you know, U magnitude, G magnitude, redshift is Z, radius, uh, and color. And then we also have a set of, of perturbed uh, photometry, so we can look at what effect noise has. So in this case, we perturb by adding square root of 3 times the error, times a, a Gaussian, uh, which and it has the effect of doubling the sizes of all errors on all the points, because square root of 3 squared plus 1 squared is 4. Um, okay. 
Then we have to do some setup specifically for scikit-learn. Uh, scikit-learn expects all of its inputs to be 2D arrays for the training sets, uh, for, for, the, for the, the features we're going to use. 2D arrays, one dimension is the number of objects in the, in the training set. One dimension is the, the number of features. So we, if we have 5,000 objects and five features, it would be a 5,000 by five array. So we do all that. And then we just set up the random forest regressor telling it it's going to use 50 trees, up to 30 steps in the tree, um, and let it determine how many features to use at a time. It has just a formula to do that. And that's basically most of the work we need to do to, to set up the random forest. And then it's just one line to, to train it. Um, OK, this is just defining color. I, I basically did that. Um, and so if you go to the, next, uh, to, to the next box, it starts with if 0. 0 returns as false. So that means uh, if something is false, do this. But 0 is false, so it does nothing. I've done this throughout the notebook. I, don't want, I didn't want you to see all the results when you loaded the notebook. So what I want you to do, you have to do some programming. Change 0 to 1. Click in the box, hit Shift Enter. And it should produce a set of, of plots of colors, size, and magnitude versus redshift. So what time do we start at? OK. Um, so you should see that different colors are sensitive at different redshifts. And to first order, what you're seeing is that 4,000 angstrom break moving to longer and longer wavelengths as you move to higher redshifts. So it goes from being between the U and G band at very low redshifts to G and R, R and I, I and Z, Z and Y. OK. So now we'll do a photo Z. So we'll go to the next box, change 0 to 1. What we're doing here is, first of all, we split our data into two sets. We're going to use half of the data to train the random forest and half of the data to test the results of the random forest. Um, so this, this routine here, train, test, split, does exactly that. So we randomly split, but I'm giving uh, us all the same, uh, the, the same random seed. And then we, we fit the random forest by just this one line. We have our regressor object. We fit uh, with the training set of color, or magnitude, sorry, in each band, and the redshifts that we want to predict. And then we, we apply that to get predictions for the test set with the object's predict function, its method. Um, and that will create a photometric redshift estimate for every object. That simple. One line to train, one line to apply. And then we apply this plot and stats routine to make a photo Z spec Z plot and to get the results. So change 0 to 1, and you can look at the results. And you should find something that doesn't look quite as good as the plot from Rongpu I showed you before. So there are better and worse ways to do this analysis. If you go to the next text box, you can um, see what happens if you test with the same set of data you use to train. So change the if 0 to if 1. So if you use the same data to test as to train, does it get better or worse in terms of those statistics? Better. But it's, it's kind of circular. You, you created a, a, a predictor that can predict those points as accurately as possible. So you get a biased result for the performance of an algorithm when you test it with the same data you used to train it. So you never want to do that. Um, a better way is to use cross-validation, uh, which I won't have time to talk about, but basically allows you to use your entire data set as the test set. So you now have 8,500 objects you can test the algorithm with. But it's never using the same object to train and to test. So it rotates through the objects, placing them in training and test sets. That's a much better way to do things. So you can skip the cross-validation. It's slower. That's the downside. Um, so we used magnitudes in what I gave you before. So we used u magnitude, g magnitude, r magnitude, i magnitude, z magnitude, y magnitude, just as raw values. So the disadvantage of that is there's actually a lot of information encoded in the colors of objects. If you plot just a magnitude, you'll see magnitude corresponds to redshift roughly. 
But we're losing the information about the spectral features, the jumps, except very indirectly when we look at a set of magnitudes. So we can have a space of, of features that's much more closely tied to what's intrinsically in the data by looking at colors, flux ratios, instead of magnitudes. So the next box will use colors instead of magnitudes. Does the performance get better or worse when you use colors? Compared to what we got with uh, the 50% the training test, magnitudes only. The first thing you did. Okay. okay. Now we can add one magnitude measurement because we started out with six measurements. We had U, G, R, I, Z, and Y. When we look only at colors, that's looking at the differences between bands. That's only five measurements. So we discarded some information. So we can get that back by adding one more magnitude. And this basically emulates what a prior would do or could do in a training set basis method. So if you add the magnitude measurement, does it get better or worse? Can people shout out? So all you're doing is changing zero to one and shift enter. Okay. So we're adding a magnitude measurement. So we start with just flux ratios. Now we're having a flux in one band as well as five flux ratios. Exactly. I. I added the I magnitude, which is the same one that's plotted when you have the plots of things versus redshift. Uh, we have six bands, just like LSST. Okay, so, still six so, but we have five colors. There are five differences, yeah, or five independent differences from, from six colors. Okay, so the next thing, yeah, oh, Phil. So, yeah, so the, the reason is we're sort of giving the, the algorithm a hint that differences between magnitudes, so flux ratios, are interesting or useful. So we could have done something like a PCA on the, on the data set and used those as inputs to the algorithm, and that would be another way of, of trying to get at the underlying structure in the data. Um, in this case, we're getting at it because we know that as you shift an object in redshift, mostly the color changes, the magnitude changes a little, but there's a wide range of possible magnitudes at a given redshift. So colors are more informative. And we know that, and we're sort of giving a shortcut to the machine learning algorithm that puts that structure in. It certainly should be possible to have a machine learning algorithm that can pick that up on its own. Random Forest doesn't do too well at that. It does, okay. it does pretty good, right? Just giving it raw magnitudes, it does a pretty good photo z, right? Our goal is 5%, it's doing what, 3.5% in that regime. Um, but we can do better by putting in what we know about the problem. Good question. Other questions so far about what we've been doing here? Pat. So have people fooled uh, around with the fact which color and which magnitude like Yeah, we actually, so, so a student of mine tried that with some, uh, for the photo z working group. It doesn't make much difference which magnitude you do because Basically, the information is the same with those colors plus any choice of magnitude. But we did actually test that. It shouldn't make a difference because the information is the same. Have people tried to use these new um, involved learning apps or deep learning apps with multiple huge numbers of Yeah, so people have, there's a, a history of using uh, earlier versions of neural network techniques um, in PhotoZ. They tend to extrapolate extremely poorly. And they, and they, they tend to, learn sort of uh, the redshift distribution. You know, if you have any uh, redshift peaks due to the large scale structure in your training set, that gets magnified in the neural network results. So it's a very nonlinear effect, uh, algorithm, or, the, or these things tend to be very nonlinear, and that tends to do bad things in PhotoZ. But they haven't actually, I don't think they've actually. Sort of a new class. I know it's a new class, but it's, it's basically just a new uh, evolution of the neural net methods. So my expectation is it's not going to be a huge effect, but it's worth trying. And uh, if you look, if somehow you get to the end of the notebook by the end of our lecture, I do have some suggestions of things you can try. And trying other scikit-learn algorithms is one of those suggestions for what to do if you have extra time. Uh, OK. So you add size. Do things get better with, when you add size? 
No, so size, when you're looking at higher redshifts, the size of objects doesn't change much with redshift. So it, it's, it gives fairly weak information, unfortunately. Okay, uh, let's skip this. Um, it is the case that in some situations you can do better for protases for red galaxies. You can try that. Um, so uh, let's talk about challenges in photosees. So the biggest problem we have in exploring photosee algorithms is that in deep samples, samples of faint galaxies, when you try to get redshift spectroscopically for those galaxies, about a quarter of the time you fail in the best cases. In the worst cases, it's more like 60%. So this is now a plot as a function of I-band magnitude. What fraction of objects yield a secure redshift? A secure redshift requires multiple spectroscopic features, uh, including the possibility that it's a, the, the oxygen-2 doublet, for people who are familiar with that. Um, and so from D2, for instance, we have very high redshift success at the bright end. But by the time we're over here at I of 22 and a half, it's more like, oops, 80%. As we go to higher redshift still, it drops below 50%. LSST is down here at 25.3. <laughs> so with an hour exposure time on a 10 meter telescope, we'd have negligible success rate at that, at that, at that, at that uh, magnitude. You need to expose much longer. So if you want to use your set of galaxies with spectroscopic redshifts to calibrate the results of your photo Z of it. To say, okay, what is the mean redshift of a sample? It's 1.01 .01 plus or minus 0.001 or, or such. Then you need something like 99 to 99.9% .9 completeness to not have systematics that exceed the LSST requirements. Um, so it's likely that calibration will not rely on that direct method. But instead, other methods, I've worked a lot on cross-correlation techniques that can recover what is the bias in your redshift, what is the actual scatter, or what is the actual N of Z, the redshift distribution, for samples. But for training set techniques, this is a really bad issue because you're training with the things you did get redshifts for, but they have systematically different spectral energy distributions and colors than the things you didn't. So I want to uh, take the last, uh, well, the last minute, <laughs> uh, to, to, look at, um, to look at those effects, a little, let's go two minutes. Um, so the next boxes, if, if you skip the red galaxies part, looks at what happens if you have different training and test sets. So what does this incompleteness do to a, a machine learning based algorithm? So I want you to try each of those uh, possibilities. So a selection in magnitude, a selection in color, a selection in redshift for your training that's different from the test set. See what it does to the photo Z spec Z plot. Uh, and I, you know, I, I hate to end on a down note, but uh, you'll see just how bad these incompletenesses can be and why it's important for us to have other methods of calibrating data than relying on direct calibration. So, I want you to do that and in your groups decide which of these was worst. We'll talk about which of these actually occurs in the real data. So which problem was worst? Color. I, I got very different red results. Well, look at redshift. Color is bad. 
Redshift, I, I think, is even worse because Redshift, you get nonsense. Yeah, but uh, with Redshift, you're putting everything at the wrong. Well, that's true. Both are bad. <laughs> okay, I'll accept color as an answer. So, in the real world, that incompleteness that we saw, the fact that the redshift completeness, the rate of secure redshift is a function of magnitude, is number one, a function of redshift. There are redshift ranges where we don't get multiple features in the spectroscopy, so we just don't get redshifts for things in those ranges. So we have a very strong redshift selection, selection. We also have a pretty strong color selection, because color corresponds, if we go back to that plot of the different templates, those templates that have strong emission lines, the very bluest templates, can have very, those redshifts are easy to get. The ones that don't have strong emission lines are harder to get, and that corresponds closely with color. Let's see if I go back there. So our success rate is a strong function. Here we go. So these emission lines are what we use to measure redshifts often. Those go away at redder colors. So our success rate is a strong function of redshift, a strong function of color. So if you train your machine learning algorithm with this data set that's censored in redshift, censored in colors, and apply it to data that's uncensored, you get nonsense out, basically. And you know, this is at some level an exaggeration in what you're looking at now, but it's not that far an exaggeration compared to what happens when you apply these algorithms in the real world. So, uh, you know, the machine learning techniques were great for us all to be able to run a photo Z algorithm, develop our own photo Z algorithm right here. You can apply scikit-learn, you can do better. I'd love to hear about things that do better than the random forest you did. So, I encourage you to play around with what's in scikit-learn. But you have to also understand those limitations when you're applying these photo Z algorithms. And I expect that in the end, we'll probably end up with something that's template-based for LSST but for which we may develop a machine learning emulator to be able to get fast results as well. But uh, we'll see. We've got about five years to do better. Yeah? Jeff, does um, the problem with the machine learning uh, not being able to sample, if you don't have your color space and your interest space properly, doesn't that, it's still in the template that's in this base method as well, assuming you don't get your templates right or you don't get your priors? Yeah, so you need to get your templates right uh, the priors, I think, will we'll address hierarchically, so I think you're okay there. Um, but in the template-based case, the priors, can, the, the templates, assuming that the family of galaxies spectra evolves in at least a, a, a simple way with redshift, and again, you can have hierarchical parameters for that as well, the template-based methods have a very well-defined way to extrapolate. That we'll still have to calibrate, but that, that, the, the, the errors in that process are not going to be huge. With the machine learning methods, all the methods I know about just have no way of, of extrapolating in those scenarios. And so they, they give nonsense. 